Hello everyone and welcome back to the Level Up English podcast. We have a really fun conversation lined up today. I am talking today with Claire. Claire is an English teacher from the UK. She runs the English at Home website and the Smart English Coach podcast. This episode today will be a cross post, which means Claire is also posting it on her podcast as well. So what I would suggest you to do is perhaps listen to this episode and then once you've done that, go over to Claire's podcast, Smart English Coach, and have a listen there. It's really easy to follow. If you can understand me in this episode, you will understand Claire as well. It's really easy to follow and she talks about interesting topics over there. So I hope you enjoy Claire's podcast. But first of all, I hope you enjoy our podcast here today together. Claire also runs the English Fluency Club, which is a place where people come together and speak English regularly with people all around the world. So she's very busy and she does a lot online. In fact, I mentioned in the episode how even before we connected, I had come across her so many times online because whenever I would search for some terms or vocabulary to plan for a lesson, Claire's website would pop up. So I always remember seeing her photo on the side of the website. And then when we got in touch, I was like, oh, I know you. I know. I already know who you are. It, so it was a nice coincidence there. So there's also a chance that you may have come across Claire's website on your own as well. And regarding the topic today, we had a really fun conversation. It just flowed really well. We spoke about language learning. We spoke about overcoming limiting beliefs in language learning and also how to be more confident something that I feel quite passionate about, how to gain confidence uh, in language learning and in your you know, general life as well. And we also spoke about the phrase, fake it till you make it. Is that a good thing to do or not? So lots of useful advice, I think, coming up here. We also spoke about age, whether age is a real factor when it comes to language learning. You know, is it harder for older people to learn a language? Is that a good excuse? We'll come to that one. We speak about the importance of repetition. And Claire also tells me about a really interesting method called the 1% sports coaching method that can be applied to many different things in life. And it really has a good lesson behind it. So hopefully this conversation will be enjoyable and motivational. And I'm sure you will learn a lot as I did in the conversation. So I really hope you enjoy it. Once again, don't forget to check out Claire's uh, website and podcast. I will put links in your show notes on the app on your phone so you can see it there, hopefully. But let's get right into the episode. Hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Hope you're doing well. This, as I understand it, Claire, is a cross post, right? So we're going to be sharing this on both of our podcasts. So That's right. I guess one of us is not really taking the interview spot we're kind of talking as as equals so to speak so i don't i don't know if you would like to introduce yourself to my listeners first just briefly yes yeah, so first of all thank you very much michael for arranging this it's really nice to speak to you to meet you and so for people who don't know me my name is claire and I've been teaching English for quite a long time, for more than 20 years, let's say. And I've taught English all over the world, but I'm now back in the UK. Uh, some of you might know me from my website, which is englishathome.com. And this is um, a resources site, so it provides lots of information on how to learn English. And I also run the Smart English Coach podcast. Yeah, fantastic. I, I did say to you by email, didn't I, that I've kind of come across your website many times in the past because uh, I guess it ranks quite well on Google. So whenever I'm like looking for some slang words or some phrases, your website always pops up near the top. And there That's, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's <laughs> fantastic, isn't it? The internet. Yes. So the, the site's been going for quite a long time. So that means that it's, um, it's easy for people to find my pages on grammar and vocabulary and speaking and so on, yes. Yeah, fantastic. I guess for the benefit of your audience, I can just say that I'm Michael, Michael Lavers. I'm from the southwest of England. 
I've been teaching online for a few years, not so many, maybe, how long has it been now? Four, five, seven, eight years? I, I can't count really, but something like that. Um, and in the last five years or so, I transitioned over to podcasting. So that's the main thing I do now, Level Up English Podcast. And I have an online website as well, where I talk about uh, different grammar topics and English lessons. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, quite simple, really. Perfect. Perfect. And in fact, um, your podcast goes out to people from all over the world, doesn't it? Yes, very big uh, global audience, which I'm very proud of. Mm. Uh, I think number one country is Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, people are often surprised to hear that, but a lot of, lot of Saudi listeners. So hello if you're from Saudi Arabia. But yeah, people from all over the world, which is always nice to hear uh, those people contacting me. Is it yeah. not the same for you? Um, my audience is more in Europe, but for your Arab listeners, I just want to say Mahaba. And I hope that that pronunciation is good. But yes, um, all over the world. Um, and also a surprising number of people from the States as well. And I think that's because there are so many speakers of other languages living in the United States. Interesting. Okay, so it's like, it's like people that are learning English as a second language, yes. but they want to kind of get by. Uh, and live in in their new country, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, amazing! Yeah, really cool. I I, I love imagining the the listeners and how hopefully the podcasts are benefiting them in their in their daily life. That's and also where they're listening as well. So, are they on the way to work, or you know, are you perhaps taking your dog for a walk? I know that one of my listeners listens to the podcast when he's taking his dog for a walk. It's always interesting to wonder where you are as you as you listen to us speak. Yeah, I, I get messages every now and then. Like people post a picture on Instagram, like working out at the gym, listening oh. to the Level Up English, or someone said they, they clean their bathroom while they listen. And I guess... <laughs> If I can make that job easier, then I'll, I'll be proud of that. <laughs> That's a fan yeah, fantastic use of your time. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I, I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about your background, if that's okay, because mm. I know you have uh, spent quite a lot of time abroad in various mm. places. And I'm kind of curious how that links to your teaching background too. Is there a connection there? Yes. Yeah, so I've always loved languages. At school, the only thing I could do um, well um, was French. Uh, and I loved the idea that when you speak a different language, you you inhabit a different world almost, you know. And, and th as I went through school, I realised that, that French was something that would perhaps take me somewhere, you know. And I then went on to study French at university and in the UK education system, if you study a, a modern language at university, you then have to spend a year in the country where it's spoken. So I ended up speak, uh, spending a year in France and it was wonderful. I didn't speak English at all for almost a year. And of course, in that time, you know, you, because you're immersed in in that um, language, you do make progress quite quickly. And you learn lots of things that you wouldn't typically learn in a course book. And I think that's also very important. So then when I came back to the UK and I finished my degree, I thought, okay, I'm gonna become a teacher and I'm going to teach English as a foreign language. Because I knew if nothing else, it would give me mobility. It would enable me to go and live and work abroad um, because I could teach English abroad. And then um, I then ended up traveling and I spent some time in Hong Kong um, and I spent some time in, in lots of other Asian countries as well. And that also, although I never managed to learn Cantonese because Cantonese is a very, very difficult language for us to learn because of the tones, you know. So I never picked up Cantonese, but I was still interested in the languages and um, and it's the fact that, you know, when you live in a, a foreign country, there's also the culture to appreciate. And I then lived in other countries. I lived in the Netherlands for a few years. And then I moved to Italy and I spent 17 years in Italy. And that's where I learned Italian quite well. My Italian is pretty fluent. I, again, I never learned really from a course book. I was immersed in 
in the country. I had to learn Italian quite quickly for my job and and also just for living so all the bureaucracy of living and again I'm learning through listening through speaking with people I'm learning in a quite informal way and I think what the this experience has has helped me in my teaching at least is to not necessarily teach with textbooks with course books but to teach English that people use the real English conversation English and that led me on to Um, teaching, for example, what I call fluency phrases. Teachers will know this as we we call it lexical chunks, for example, but I call these fluency phrases, you know, that they're the building bricks of conversation. And also to try and find smart ways of learning English. So again, rather than sitting with a 60 hour course book um, and going to formal lessons, how can you learn online? How can you learn just the things that are going to bring your level up? quickly so that's I think really my philosophy of teaching to to teach what's really useful what's really natural and to make the process as easy as possible what about you Michael what about your background that's amazing I don't know if I can top that now that that sounds that sounds really uh I don't know it's really interesting yeah I mean I I I can relate to what you said about immersion I think that's interesting and being in another country surrounded by the language it it it, if you make some effort like it it doesn't naturally mean that you're gonna get good at the language but if you actually put the effort in and try to talk to people especially Mm. if they don't speak English or your native language it's so fun and enjoyable and hopefully easy to improve quickly yes um I've I've had, had that before but in terms of my background where to start I guess I I kind of landed in in doing this partly because of my love for travel and culture and seeing new places I was fed up of my of my work at the time and I just decided just to buy like a ticket to to Japan and I had no I didn't book any accommodation I just bought a plane ticket and I was like I'll work it out when I get there and at the time there it was quite challenging because it was my first solo trip abroad and I was there for a month and there was a lot of problems that came up but the one of the big lessons I got from that is just how small my world was before that mm. and how big the world actually is and I wanted to kind of get more involved in that and I you know I think the best way of doing that is to learn languages and connect with different people in their native tongue so yeah, and I think I also of, that the yeah. um, better your language level, the deeper your connection becomes as well, obviously. Sure, so yeah. you know, knowing Italian really well meant that I could understand Italian culture a little bit better and the history of the country. And it just meant that my time in Italy was much more rewarding. It was much more satisfying because I understood the jokes. I understood the cultural references. And I think, yes, that, that's a, such a, a motivating factor when you learn a language because it as you said you know it's it's not just your love of travel but also understanding the culture and you know the food the background why people think the way they think and it, your life becomes much much richer I think for that definitely definitely and I, I'm sure you can relate like one of the best feelings for me is making someone laugh in another yes. language yes uh, like actually pulling off a joke successfully yes. you're yes. just kind of using these sounds that maybe previously were just it was just noise for you and now yes. somehow it's making people laugh which is always yes. a good feeling and it's such a human connection isn't it when you have humor yeah, yeah definitely um but yeah basically i kind of realized the best way to surround myself with languages was to teach them myself and mm. uh i'm not a very smart person perhaps so i just well english is the only language i really know that well at the time so naturally i went into teaching english <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it'd be nice to teach more in the future if I, if I get better perhaps I, I did want to ask you about confidence because this is something that I have struggled with in the past like confidence mm. in language learning and I think more uh, I, I see more now like my own students they might skip classes or not actually mm. join group classes because they they don't mm. have confidence and mm. they're afraid 
So have you seen that in your students as well or in, yes. your, in yourself and perhaps? It's interesting that you say that you also have experienced kind of a lack of confidence and I have as well. And I, I think it's one of those things that as teachers, we always say to our students, you know, you need to build up your confidence. But unless that, unless we have already experienced it ourselves, then it's very difficult to kind of explain it well and I, I think you know teachers should also be language learners and you know when you look at your own experiences of learning a language and you see where confidence has been a problem for you and I, it gives you empathy doesn't it for for your students and I think one one of the things about confidence is that it's absolutely essential for learning a language well and one of the reasons why I think people aren't as confident as they could be is because they have this idea that they have to be really good or kind of perfect mm. in, in a language. And so it's natural, especially if you're learning English as an adult or for us learning another language as an adult, it's natural to want to do our best. It's natural to not want to make mistakes because we might feel that someone is going to judge us or someone is going to laugh at us. So we might feel embarrassed or ashamed about our English. And I think also for, for, for you who, you know, living in a different country and for me living in Italy, we also want to kind of fit in to the country. We don't want to be seen as the foreigner. And, you know, we kind of want to be, to be thought of as almost native level. And that kind of idea of like being perfect, I think really stops us from making improvements. So one of, you know, the first problem with it is that it puts a lot of pressure on us. If we want to avoid mistakes at all costs, we end up not trying anything new. We end up um, not volunteering for situations where we could really stretch ourselves and, and make progress. So maybe we don't volunteer to give a presentation at work or maybe we decide, oh, I'm not going to apply for that job because the interview will be in English and, you know, I might make a mistake. So wanting to be perfect keeps us where we are, keeps us kind of small, mm. stops our progress. And of course, also, it's, it's impossible to be perfect. You know, if you think, oh, I want to speak like a native speaker, well, native speakers make mistakes all the time. You know, I make mistakes in English all the time. It, it's an impossible task, really. So wanting to be perfect, although, I, you know, it's understandable. You don't want to make mistakes. But, you know, at the same time, it stops us from growing. It keeps us where we are. Whereas confidence, which is, you know, all in your head, is the thing that's going to help you improve your English because it reduces the anxiety, it reduces the stress. Have, have you also found this, Michael, in your own experiences and, and with your students? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the the story that came to mind sounds a bit unrelated, but I think it's a good practical example of what, what you're talking about. So I've been, uh, I've been into longboarding, which is like skateboarding, but on a longer board oh, okay. for about 10 years. Uh, but... In those 10 years, I can probably count on one hand like the number of times I've fallen off. And I don't think that's yeah. because I'm good at longboarding, but I think it's because I want to be perfect. I, I don't want to take any unnecessary risks, which, you know, maybe mm. it's a good thing in some cases. You don't want to get hurt. But I, I found that connection with what you were saying about language learning, like the fact that I was trying so hard not to fall off and not take any risks kind of means I didn't really get that good. Like, mm. yeah, I can kind of ride down a gentle hill, but... I can't do anything that impressive even after 10 years because I was kind of limiting myself and not, you know, not allowing myself to take risks and do something a bit scary. And I, I think that kind of relates back to language learning, yeah, doesn't it? How absolutely you limit yourself, you'll limit your improvements. Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, we're so desperate not to you know, be judged, to have someone laugh at us, um, to feel embarrassed that we keep ourselves kind of safe in the area that we are. Um, but then, you know, as you say, for real growth, you do have to take a few risks. And, and obviously, mm -hmm. you, you know, your risk might have been a physical risk of you know, getting physically hurt. Um, but the, the risk of um, making a mistake with your English is probably 
less important because generally speaking, people don't remember the mistakes. They'll remember the sense of the conversation. They'll remember how they felt speaking to you, but they won't really remember an individual grammar mistake. And I think that's yeah, very important yeah. to, to keep in mind. Yeah, and I think even one step further uh, is even when someone makes a mistake, people might not even notice it because yeah. like I can talk for myself when I'm talking to someone who maybe they, their native language isn't English. You, you have to pay really hard, really close attention to yeah. actually spot the mistakes because you're focused on understanding them. So if there is a mistake, your brain kind of naturally skips over it. So often yes. it's not even noticeable, is it? And in fact, I think the more confident you appear, the less likely we're going to listen for right. mistakes. <laughs> so if a person is quite hesitant when they speak, you might think, oh, this person doesn't speak English as a first language and you're kind of prepared to listen for examples of that. And that might also include mistakes. But if the person who you're speaking to appears confident, appears happy and relaxed, then you also feel happy and relaxed and the conversation is easier. And of course, it's, it's difficult to kind of fake confidence. Um, so that's why it really is a question of it being in here. But that, it, that is an important thing to remember, in, especially for things like, um, should we say, um, kind of risky situations like interviews or exams. You really do want to appear confident so that the other person feels happier in a way talking to you, less likely to hear mistakes, less likely to hear hesitation and more open to understanding what you say. That's something I've actually not thought of before is the the kind of the way that you're affecting other people. So yeah, I think I'm going yeah. to I'm going to try to use that in myself in my own language learning and see, <laughs> see if that makes a difference too. <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to ask because you kind of mentioned about faking it because there's this phrase that people use a lot which is fake it till you make it. Like if, if you don't feel confident just pretend to be confident yeah. and then it will become real. And yeah. I'm honestly not sure if that's a good idea but do you have any opinion on that? Well Yes, actually, I think fake it till you make it is not bad advice because, as I said, I think confidence is all, you know, in the mind. And when you start thinking about the beliefs, the ideas that keep you from making progress, these are all ideas that you can change because they are just ideas. So, for example, you might think, hmm, I'm too old to learn a language or you might think, well, I'm just not good at languages. I was never good at, say, French at school or whatever language you learned at school. So that means that as an adult, I can't do it. Or you might think, oh, I don't have time to learn English because it's such a big thing to learn. I'll never be able to do it. And these are really good examples of what we call kind of limiting beliefs. And if we believe this thing, it gives us almost an excuse not to try. But if you really do need English for, for one reason or the other, what you can do with these beliefs is try and kind of rewrite them in your mind. So that is kind of like faking it till you make it, I suppose. So, you I mean, for example, take the example of um, I'm too old to learn a language. And, you know, lots of people say, oh, it's easy for kids, you know, children, put two children together, they'll start playing together, they'll understand each other, they'll learn English really quickly. And while that is true that, you know, children do have quite sort of like plastic brains and, you know, they absorb information, it's not actually strictly true. In fact, some of the research shows us that as adults, we can be really successful language learners because we have advantages that children don't have. So we have life experience that children mm -hmm. don't have. We have a richer vocabulary that children don't have. Um, we, for example, we have maybe different types of motivation for learning a language. You know, it could be for our job. It could be because we need to pass an exam. So we have this kind of motivation that kids just don't have. So one of the ways that you can become more confident is to kind of rewrite that rather than saying, oh, well, I, I can't learn English very well because I'm, I'm not a child anymore. Think about your strengths. Well, actually, I have all this life experience. I have more ways to express myself. I have different motivations. And then put yourself in the situation, for example, where you will talk about your life experience or you will give your opinion. Use your strengths. 
you know, to to become, to get more confident about your English and to kind of rewrite the ideas that hold you back. And I think working on ideas like this is really, really helpful because it puts you in a position of power rather than in a position of like, oh, I can't do it, so I won't try. You're giving yourself um, reasons why you can do something. And this is where I think the fake it till you make it comes in. It's like, okay, appear this confident person until you are that confident person. Because if you relax your face, if you smile, if you keep eye contact with, with somebody, they'll also relax and smile and keep eye contact with you and the conversation will become easier. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, I, I guess it goes both ways, but a lot of people yeah. think, you have to change your mind in order to change your body. But I think often the reverse can be true. Like if you relax your body, then your mind feels calmer. Even in this podcast, like sometimes my shoulders go up when I kind of remember I'm being filmed. And if I just kind of lower them, I just relax and it feel nice again. <laughs> well, yes. Well, there's also all that um, research around power poses, isn't there? Like if you stand yes. or sit in a certain way, it increases... If I get this, if I'm right on this, it increases your testosterone, but reduces your cortisol. So it means that your stress hormone is is less um, powerful, but your kind of power hormone is kind of is increased. So you speak with more authority. So you speak with more confidence. People will listen to you. So you won't have that situation where, you know, people just don't listen to you because you're speaking English, uh, you know, as your, as your second language and, and that they just ignore you. People are in, compelled to listen to you. Um, I'm not entirely sure about the science of it, but certainly the research shows that, you know, if you sit really defensively, if nothing else, you're going to make your voice smaller and you're going to contract your throat. But if you open up, you have more oxygen, if nothing else. Yeah, I, I'm always really interested in the topic of uh, posture and how it affects mm. your, your mind. And I, I'm always quite conscious of it. So sometimes, you know, I, I think like many of us, I get quite anxious when I go to a new place, like a new cafe, some, a kind of unfamiliar environment. Yeah. So these days I kind of consciously take up more room when I'm sitting down. So yeah. I might like put my arm on the back of the seat and like spread my body out a little bit not yeah. not in an obnoxious way I'm not you know putting my feet on the table but just like <laughs> <laughs> kind of opening up my body a bit it really does help me feel more confident and more relaxed and yes I, I if people haven't thought about that before I recommend trying it and seeing how they feel <laughs> yes but yes not taking up the space of other people so it's not like being on an yes. airplane where you sort of take up the, <laughs> the armrest and all the leg room you know but yes to, to to occupy your space yes yeah your space yes yes yeah uh yeah I I also had in mind I wanted to ask you because as you said age is a common limiting belief when it comes to language learning and it, it's quite hard for me to say you know, if someone's older than me, I can't really say oh, age doesn't matter because, mm. you know, they're, they're older. I, I can't really argue. Mm. Uh, maybe with science I could. But do, do you remember the oldest student you've ever had? That's what I wanted to ask. Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I have students who are in their 60s. Mm. And, you know, I think with, with age, you know, obviously you, you get maturity, but then you also get examples of where, you know, um, things haven't always gone gone your way. And I think this is one of the, the problems that you have um, with confidence anyway. I, I think it doesn't matter how high a level you are of English or how much experience you have with English. There, there will always be an occasion which kind of shakes, you know, shakes your confidence, which reduces your confidence. So even if your English is really good and you've got lovely vocabulary and you use nice grammar and your pronunciation is great and, you know, you've got all these lovely ideas that you can talk about, there will be a time when you're just not prepared for the conversation or mm. you've, it's, a, it's a situation you've never been in before and you think, well, how can this happen? I've studied English for so many years and I know all of this, all of this English, I should be able to handle a conversation now. What happened? Why was it such a disaster? And I think, you know, it's just one of those situations where sometimes you will suffer, or you will experience a lack of confidence because you haven't been prepared or because someone says something to you which is so surprising that you're lost for words. 
And those situations are always going to happen. And sometimes there's not even any logic about it. I, I often say to people, learning a language is like having good good hair days and bad hair days, you know. So sometimes you <laughs> no hair days. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you're lucky, Michael, you're lucky. Because, yeah. you know, especially for women, and the women in the audience are going to say, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Some days your hair is amazing. You don't have to do anything with it. And it just looks brilliant. And then some days it doesn't matter what you do. It is always going to look a mess. And that's for me my default, you know, because I don't use a hair dryer or anything like that. So most days it doesn't look very elegant. It only looks good when I go to the hairdresser. And lang language learning is like that. It's not really logical. Some days it's effortless. And your English is just beautiful and it, you don't have to think, the words come out and it, it, you just feel really, really good. And then some days, maybe you haven't had enough sleep, or maybe you're stressed about something, maybe it's just an off day. And that's, that's mm -hmm. just really natural because, you know, learning a language isn't like in a straight line. You know, you have to come back to things, you have to review things and it's just not, you, you can't predict. Some days will be good, some days not. But I think also as you as you get older, you might think, well, you know, these days shouldn't happen because I've been learning English for so many years. But unfortunately, that's just part of human nature. It's it's the human experience. You know, some days we'll communicate better than others. Yeah, yeah, I, I can feel myself getting excited because I, I love this topic. Um, <laughs> I, I talk about it quite a bit of how uh, our own perception of our ability does fluctuate. It goes up yeah. and down day by day. So one day I might feel like really good about my my uh, Chinese uh, learning, and then the next day I feel really bad. And mm. actually, my skill level hasn't changed. It just yes. it's just my opinion of my skill level has changed. Yes, so that's it. It's your perception really of it, isn't it? Perception, and in fact, yeah. you are still the same level. And I think it's also important to realize, even if you have these kind of setbacks, you know, one day not so good, one day better you're still moving forward, you're still moving upwards. Even if it's not perfect every day, your overall trend is to improve and to increase your English. Yeah, like even if it's like, you know, two steps backwards, but maybe yeah. four steps forward or something like that, you might, it's not gonna be like a smooth ride all the time, is it? No, 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 of course, yeah. Yeah. And of course, there are other things you can do to sort of increase your confidence. And I think possibly the most important is, is just as you're saying, you know, you, you keep you keep going and you take every opportunity you can to use new language. So any time that you can use English, use it and obviously keep trying new things, because what you need to do is to move the new information to the known information. The more times you use a new word or try the pronunciation or a new grammar structure, the more times you use it, the more familiar you get with it. So it becomes easier for you to remember the next time you want to use it. And it also builds up your confidence because you can see that you're actually taking steps and moving forward. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't think this is true uh, but I heard from someone or somewhere before that you have to hear a word on average 17 times before... 17? It, 17 before it goes oh, into wow. your long-term memory and you can use it. Um, I don't... It, it sounds like it's probably not true. It's just like some, something someone said. But I, I still like saying that just to kind of give you... I think some people like to have a number, right? So Yeah. So it kind of tells them learning it once is not enough. I have to keep yeah. practicing and you know, yeah. I, I like that 17 rule. And that's why something like the, you know, the spaced repetition method works so well, isn't it? Because, you know, yeah. you, you, you see a new word, you write it down, you make a sentence with it and you try and remember it. Then you look at it again the next day, then a couple of days after that, then another week and so on. So it gives you exposure to that new word, an opportunity to see that new word again and again until it becomes more automatic for you. And I think that's a method that most people say works really well, it, it, you know, the, the spaced repetition method. Hmm. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, I, I use it, for example, with Anki. Have you used that before? Oh, yeah. Mm. Anki. Yeah, like flashcard software, really useful. Mm. Yeah, that's technological. You could you can even just use pieces of paper, which is <laughs> my preferred method, pen and paper. But yeah, yeah I know there's sure. Anki, there's Memrise, I think is another one that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice. Could I ask you about something that I honestly don't know anything about, but you mentioned it to me before the podcast, which was... 
sports coaching method? Yes, yes, the 1% sports coaching method. Yeah, this is something I read about and I thought, you know, this is something also that I tend to do as a teacher. And it's interesting that the methodology is the same and the results are also phenomenal. So the 1% sports coaching method is a method that the coach of the men's cycling team used to improve their performance. So the Mm -hmm. British men's cycling team, I think, before this method, had never won a major competition. But after they used it, they won the Tour de France, they won eight gold medals at the London Olympics. So the the result was so impressive. So what he did, the, the coach, was rather than think about the overall performance of the team, he broke it down to every possible thing that makes up um, a, a good performance. And he looked at improving these really small things because by themselves, they were really small things, but taken together, they had incredible results. So he looked at, for example, the clothes that the cyclists were wearing and ways to design them so they became more aerodynamic. So, you know, the cyclists could go faster. He looked at the bicycles themselves. So to make the saddle more comfortable so that the cyclists, you know, um, weren't uncomfortable when they were cycling, for example. Then he looked at even how they were sleeping. So how he could improve their sleep so they were better rested they had more energy so these things in themselves are quite small but if you add them together then they make up a massive massive improvement it's also called marginal gains because you're you're getting results really small results but when you add them together then you get amazing progress you know gold Mm -hmm. medals the tour de france that's a really really amazing progress and i think you can apply it to language learning as well because very often when we teach English, we say, right, you need a 60 hour course or we're going to teach a big subject like, OK, today we're going to learn the present perfect or we're going to look at the passive. These are really, really big areas. But instead of this, you can listen to someone speaking English and think, you know what, I'm going to make small adjustments. We're going to change. We're going to tweak small areas of your English one by one. And because of these things, they're going to add up to much, much bigger progress. Rather than thinking, let's tackle a big thing, let's tackle the small things. So it could be you listen to someone speak and you think, actually, there are a couple of grammar mistakes that I want to fix. You know, maybe we call these fossilized mistakes, mistakes that are kind of stuck in your head. It could be oh, there's a word that you consistently pronounce wrong. Or it could be there's a, 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 the wrong word choice, a collocation that it, that is just not right. So we're going to work on fixing these small things. Or it could be, you know, when you talk about your job, you use the same word all the time. Can you use a couple of synonyms to make your English a little bit richer? Or it could be, you know, you have to do negotiations, for example, rather than learning 10 ways to use a conditional sentence. Let's just use one conditional and use it in different contexts. So let's improve small things little by little. And overall, that's going to make the big difference. And one of the sort of advantages of this is that it's obviously very motivating because you're fixing mistakes and you're seeing results and you're seeing results quite fast. And that makes it kind of less overwhelming when you think about learning a language it it can be huge enormous but instead we're taking it in sort of like bite-sized chunks you know we're looking at Mm. small things at a time which makes it less overwhelming and of course you know one of the big things about language learning is the time involved it makes better use of your time it's it's more efficient for your time because you might not have 60 hours to do a course you know you might not be able to attend lots of lessons you just want to go in do a quick dive into your English and pick out the things which are going to make the most difference because overall they are going to increase your English if you like increase your performance and that's why I I like it I like it for general language learning but also for you know these kind of like emergency situations you know you've got a job interview you haven't got 20 hours to read a job interview book you know but let's go and look at the little things which are going to make such a big difference yeah I love that uh, I, I have actually heard it before. I, as soon as you started explaining it, it started to ring all these yeah. bells. But so many words kind of popped into my head. Like it kind of is related to compounding and yes. uh, the snowball effect, right? Yes. So I imagine once you start making these small changes, really, really small even, 
it as you said it's motivating and that kind of leads you to want to do more and it builds up and up and up and the, the snowball gets bigger as it goes down the hill that's right and, and it, it becomes faster as well doesn't it because yes. it, you know as the snowball gets bigger it gets heavier it travels faster and once you you know you've ironed out you know corrected one mistake it's like right yes on to the next. I mean, of course, there will be times you need to go back and review. It doesn't mean to say that once you've corrected one mistake, it's always corrected. You know, it's still something that you need to, you know, focus on. But overall, you're looking at that the small things that make such a difference. I mean, it's excellent if you're already at an intermediate level and you want to kind of push past that, you know, that plateau we often talk about to get to a more expert level. Um, actually, I would say that at the beginning levels, you know, you probably do need to spend more time on, on structure. But if it's like your English is already good and you just want to make it fantastic, you know, this is a really good way, I think, of doing it and of respecting people's time and energy levels as well. Mm. I also think it's surprising how how small uh, an individual person's vocabulary is, like, mm when learning a language you kind of think oh i have to learn all the words yeah. and you know eventually it's nice if you can kind of understand the meaning of most words you hear but the actual words that one person uses is not that varied like if you were to write down all the words you use in one day on an, on an average day probably it's a lot of the same words again and again yes uh, so i guess that goes back to what you were saying of like even a little bit that you can learn like learn this simple grammar rule this phrase this word it goes a it long can... way <laughs> yes 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 well that that's really true and I think our you know native speaker vocabularies are quite small and I I don't know how many thousands of words it is but it it is pretty small compared to the the, the number of words in the English language but even if you look at the dictionaries, they, they might have like a core vocabulary of something like 2000 words. And if you know those 2000 words, then you're great. You can speak in pretty much any situation. So you're yeah. right. And even with grammar as well, simple grammar goes a very, very long way. You don't need to use very complex grammatical structures to communicate in everyday situations. Mm, yeah absolutely like people often ask me about the future perfect tense which is <laughs> i would say the hardest of the tenses mm. right mm. like i will have done something mm. and i i do think once you get to like a higher more advanced level it's 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 good if you understand it yeah but you you can get by you 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 can get your yeah. go through your whole life and never use it exactly um, it's just not essential but it, it has a slight different feeling than future tense yeah. but I mean, I think it's, it's also, weird, you know, for people who want to have a higher level, you know, it's it's not enough, it's not good enough to say, oh, well, you don't need it. Because obviously, <laughs> if you if you do want to have a more sophisticated uh, level of English, then that's fantastic. You know, ambition is a really good thing for learning a language. You know, it's, it's a motivating thing for learning a language. But if, if your purpose is to get by, to communicate, then keep it simple by all means. But yes, yeah, so the future perfect has its uh, has its uses. The future continuous has its uses, and these are the sorts of things that get tested anyway at you know in the advanced exams. Um, but as you say, you're unlikely to hear it as often as you hear um, more everyday things. And I think also in my experience of learning Italian. The, the more um, sophisticated forms, I didn't even hear when I was at the lower levels. It, it, they just passed me by completely. It was only when I had studied a little bit and I kept seeing this, this form, or you know, not keep seeing, but yeah, I saw it yeah. a couple of times thinking, what is this? You know, I keep, you know, I've seen it more than once. It's obviously important, but I don't know what it is. And I hadn't come across it. And that's when I got curious and, and asked people. But I think, you know, if you're at a, sort of a pre-intermediate level, a lot of the complicated structures will just go over your head anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that reminds me, I have no idea what it's called, but I think it has a name where you, you know, as you know, you buy a new car and then you start seeing that car everywhere. Right? Yes, that's right. But before yes. you had the car, you were totally unaware that how many of them were on the road. And yes. it, I think it's the same in, in, in languages. Like there's a, a grammar point in Chinese that I recently learnt. And now I, I see it everywhere. And it's one <laughs> of the most useful grammar points like, I, I, I use in my speaking. But I just I wasn't really aware of it before. Yeah. But so 
yeah, learning a little bit can go a long way. And you may not, you may not even realize how important that little bit is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what a fascinating discussion <laughs> about <laughs> learning languages and confidence. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. I, I think it's been fascinating. Uh, we've spoken about a lot of topics, some that I kind of expected we would and some that were totally spontaneous. But maybe before we go, we could remind people where they can find us again, if uh, our audiences don't know. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a really, really interesting conversation. And I think you know, we talk, as I said, we talk a lot about learning languages and how important it is for us to keep learning languages as well, because that helps us at least understand where our students are. So it was very interesting to hear about your experiences of learning Chinese. And I believe you also learn Cornish as well. Is that right? Uh, I, I have been. I, it, it's on pause for now because right. Thai language has kind of taken its place. But right. uh, yeah, I, I know a little bit of Cornish. Yeah. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I think we should learn Cornish and Welsh in English schools as well, because it, these are our languages, which, you know, most people don't even know. But yeah, it's really interesting talking to you, Michael. Thank you so much. And just to remind people on the podcast how they can um, find out more about you, could you just very quickly give me a link? On, of course, I will in, include it in the show notes. Yeah, so the best thing you can do is just type in Level Up English Podcast on any podcast app. And if you want to go to a website, you could go to levelupenglish.school, which is where I have all the blog posts and show notes. And I'm also on Instagram, which is simply English with Michael, no spaces or anything. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask you as well? So for my audience, uh, remind us again where they can find you. Yes. So... Um, maybe the easiest uh, way to find me is from the podcast. So that's smartenglishcoach.com. Um, there's also my website, English at Home. But I think the smartenglishcoach.com podcast is easier because there's also a contact button there. So you can always get hold of me. Fantastic. Uh, and just as you said, I'll put links down below as well. So people can find that on, on my side. But yeah. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to chat and maybe we can do it again in the future. Likewise. Thank you very much indeed, Michael, for a really interesting conversation. You have been listening to the Level Up English podcast. If you would like to leave a question to be answered on a future episode, then please go to levelupenglish.school forward slash podcast. That's levelupenglish.school slash podcast. And I'll answer your question on a future episode. Thanks for listening.